Whoever's singing, please mute yourself. We can hear you. And as good as your voice is, it's not pertinent to our meeting today. Thank you. Uh, we, although we have this room at seven o'clock, all the other times we've had this room at seven o'clock, the room is empty prior to seven. Tonight, the room was occupied till seven o'clock. Therefore, we're about 10 minutes behind where we should be as we set up for our meeting. Which could not be done when we were not in the room. Thank you. Is everybody? Can everybody hear me? Say yay or nay. Yes, I can hear you well. You can't hear us. Okay. Now I'm going to plug in the microphone, and then I'm going to plug in a camera, and hopefully those will make both my sound and the video better. But let us proceed. If you'd like to follow us along, the handout that we were given by the proponent is on our agenda. If you go to the sullydistrict.org site and look at the agenda for today's meeting, one of the links will bring you to that. It's weird. The mouse isn't lining up with the buttons. Excuse us. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. You. My bad. Please mute yourself at this time before we mute everybody helter skelter. All right. Yep. We will allow you to speak. But please mute yourself at this time. Somebody once told me that the USB will always work the third time you've turned it around. <laughs> Not the first or the second, but the third time. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now in the microphone? Yes. I sound better? Yeah. Has anybody signed in who's here in person? If there's a computer independent sheets going around the room, slide in, please. We'd appreciate it. Double time and get it.
Okay, I cut this down. Uh, we can see everybody. We can see. Raise your hand if you with them. Okay, all right, so we can see you. So anybody who's going to speak needs to be in the arc of the triangle between here and that lady. Because I'm going to move this when you speak. So you see what I'm saying? Be in here, and I'm going to move this so it gets more of this room. So hold on. And if you could tell me whether I'm doing right or wrong, because I can't see. Yes. Keep on going. Good. 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 All right. All right. Okay. And if you would care to speak when called upon, please be close to that microphone. That way, the people in the black boxes up here will be able to hear you. And you shouldn't have to yell as loud as you're going to anyway. All right. Is that it? What? We're also live to explain if you do hear it, but please note, note for 90 and a lot of associations, smaller associations. Identify yourself if you can. Okay. And you please make sure that you've signed in. With that, I am going to go here. And I will be a participant in the meeting as anybody else. And now we no longer need a mic, a speaker, because we can put overhead seats. <laughs> Just two months after we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's, you know, Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming today to our January, June meeting of the Silly District Council Land Use Transportation Meeting. Uh, the meeting, and I'm going to share my desktop right now. Okay, so I'm going to make this full screen. First of all, I'm going to make this bigger. There we go, all right? And then I'm going to make this big. Well, this is not going to share, but it's not going to be. No, I'll share. Okay. All right, so here is our agenda for today. Uh, as normal, the Sully District Council has its regular meeting on the 20th, the fourth Wednesday, the 20th of June. The speaker will be Sully Supervisor Kathy Smith, who will give us the state of Sully. That's the same thing as the application. Uh, Maybe. Coming. Yeah. Okay, uh, it is uh, Kathy has agreed to join us. Uh, as we see here, it's, we have this item with Evan being here tonight. And this is a meeting that was held in May as well, this is the continuation of that meeting. And I have a link to the main agenda. We have their updated presentation, which we will use. And in this case, we had a wide ranging conversation last month. And because of that, we're trying now to focus our attention to certain areas. And what we want to do is look at the large area and compare the two possible uses of the parcel. The parcel has been proposed to be either a data center or an auto dealership facility. That's what the request is for. No, no, no. Data center or a warehouse. A, great a warehouse. A warehouse. A warehouse. A warehouse. A warehouse. And so what we have here is some items, land use zoning, transportation, parking, footprint, bar, electrical power, noise, lighting, water consumption, waste, sewer, environment. So we're going to look at each of these areas and have questions raised on those as we bring them up. We're going to try to keep this within an hour of the question and answer after the presentation is over so that we can move forward. Okay. So with that, Evan. You want me to open your yes, pages? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Evan Pritchard. I'm a attorney at uh, Cozen O'Connor, the land use counsel for the applicant uh, for this application. Uh, is 
there any way we can make that bigger, Jeff, or is that what you're working on? I have the full slide. I'm going to try to make it even bigger, bigger, bigger. Well, let's see if I can do that. Uh, maybe it's a map. Oh, it's either way. I'm making it full size here. I have to make it full, fuller size here. Okay, so now we're going to go make this bigger. And now we're going to say layout full screen view. Is that better? Okay, I think this is a better view. Yes. Okay. And I'm going to make this screen a little bit bigger because I want the people in the back of the room to see what's happening here. Okay. All right. And do I need to advance these, Jeff? Or I can advance these. That? Okay. Uh, again, my name is Evan Pritchard. I'm here with my uh, client, Zance, uh, Jock Bowden. And uh, we also have our civil engineer, uh, J.D. Cox, here. And then on the line, we have uh, our architects for the proposed data center option. And we also have uh, a sound consultant, Daniel Williams. Um, to, to help answer any questions you guys have at the end of the presentation. As Jeff mentioned, we were here on May 15th. I'm sure I recognize some mostly familiar faces here, so uh, welcome back. Uh, we heard a lot of uh, questions regarding noise impacts and uh, energy consumption, um, sight line issues. So uh, most of our presentation is an update on um, what we anticipate the noise impact will be and what the visual impact will be. Um, some of us met on site uh, with Cynthia because last time uh, there was some concern about the point we were measuring the site impacts kind of from the eastern edge of uh, Pleasant Valley. So we went back and uh, we had an up, some updated in, images uh, from the highest point uh, within Pleasant Valley that we, uh, that we met with Cynthia. Uh, with that as a little bit of background, can you go to the next slide, please, Jeff? Uh, and just as a reminder, um, we are proposing the the part of the property is zoned I five today. The other part is zoned C eight. We're proposing to rezone the C eight portion uh, to I five to match uh, the other part, the southern part, and we're proposing two different um, use options. Uh, the first of which is the one that we uh, think we're most likely going to uh, follow through with is for a data center. The second option is for a warehouse. Um, and we have a special exception that goes with, with the uh, data center option to allow for increased height and a special exception to allow for uh, increased density. The site today is approved for a car dealership that was approved in 2020. Um, and if, if another data center and a warehouse option goes, that will presumably um, be what's what's built there as a car car dealership. Uh, and whenever you're ready, you go to the next slide. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, there was there was some concern about where we measured uh, the visual impacts from last time. Um, where I'm showing the red dot there is is where we had previously measured from. Um, it's kind of on, the, as I said, kind of on the eastern edge of Pleasant Valley. The blue dot is where the uh, data center would go. That distance, just as a reminder, is is right about 3,000 uh, linear feet. Um, we we heard last time that that didn't account for the the increase of the. the um, topography of Pleasant Valley. And so we remeasured from where the green dot is. Um, that is the uh, as, as elevations go to the highest point um, in Pleasant Valley. And that is about uh, 4,800 4, feet uh, distant from the proposed data center. Next slide, please. So this is a Google Street View image of where a few of us uh, met. Uh, that's uh, right at about that point. Um, I apologize. I should know the, uh, the cross street names. Um, so but this Lewis is. Mill. I'm sorry. Lewis Mill. Lewis Mill. Lewis Mill. Lewis Mill and Cutler. Thanks, Cynthia. Uh, next slide, please. 
So it, our, our architect, Timo, um, redid the, the, uh, the sight line view um, from, from this new distance and from this new elevation. And you can see uh, on the top, that is the, the full um, sight line diagram uh, he's created from the very top of the proposed data center um, to the point on the, the left-hand side of the screen. We kind of truncated that view like we did last time in the lower image, uh, so it's a little bit easier to tell what's going on. We've got the data center on the right uh, and the homes on the right. Um, if there were, as you can see, if there were no trees or um, or intervening homes, um, you, you would have a, a, a fairly straight uh, sight line uh, to the data center. Uh, next slide. Uh, so we tried to depict that as best we can using uh, Google Earth View. Uh, the reason we selected this is because due to a quirkiness of, of how Google Earth View works, it's done some of the work for us of like stripping out um, the images of the existing trees and uh, and uh, uh, other other vegetation between uh, this point uh, and the data center. And it's difficult to see at 4,800 4, feet, um, but it, it, we so we circled it with a, a a dashed a dashed circle line, um, and you can just if you can just barely make out some red lines, uh, that would be the roof of the building. Again, that's if uh, we were to clear cut down all the um, all the trees in your neighborhood, you'd be able to just barely um, make out in the distance the the, the top of the building. Uh, next slide, please. What, can you going back to this slide? Yep. What world are those trees? Yeah. Uh, we can go back to the uh, the street view. I, I know, but I'm saying. Oh, oh, I I don't know. I can't explain how Google does its graphics and 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 has that weirdness in it. But yeah, they they. they see that was like, they're sort of floating. Yeah, above the ground. Yeah. And, and those trees are deciduous, so they will lose their leaves in the winter. Yeah, so you, you might be able to barely see it in the distance in the winter if you look hard. Um, noise impacts. Uh, we redid the, uh, the the noise study contour map um, that we showed last time um, to just be a little bit easier to, to read. This was at the request of staff because some of the lines um, weren't weren't continuous. Um, but this shows where the how the the noise. Um, Contours radiated out from the site uh, during normal operations of the of the data center. Um, you can see the light purple line that uh, extends into sort of like the, the teal green area of Pleasant Valley. Um, some of those homes in the the northeast um, area of the neighborhood um, would would hear sort of a forty decibel level um, sound. Uh, sound impacts are in normal operations. That's as, as we'll show on the uh, the next slide. We have a, um, a a table that sort of speaks to what. Yeah, here we go. So this is the. But first, before I get to that, on the left hand side is an updated contour map uh, that shows the noise impacts uh, during maintenance operations. Um, you can see there's a little bit of impact on the the properties to the northeast. Um, mostly, mostly backyards, maybe a home or two that get into the 55 decibel level. Um, this would be, uh, I said, this is maintenance operations. This would be when the generators are tested, uh, which can can occur for up to two hours a day. Um, uh, you know, periodically, uh, once a month to test the generators. Uh, the 50 decibel line then extends into a greater part of Pleasant Valley. Um, again, when, when testing is occurring, um, and I apologize, this is so hard to read. As Jeff mentioned, this is up on its website, uh, up on the um, Sully District website. Our presentation, where you can you can look at this more more clearly. But we have a table here on the right hand side um, that sort of gives you a, a feel for what these decibel levels um, mean in terms of uh, of sound. Um, Forty to fifty is is uh, characterized as sort of in the quiet range and that's sort of like a, a, a convert uh, below a conversational level um, of noise um, next slide please um, we also the, the only change that we really made in the application 
um, at staff's request since we were last since we were here last month relates to uh, getting even further out of the RPA, the resource protection area. That's you know basically the wetland sensitive area that now was identified. It's near the the cub run uh, that's fed by fed feeds into excuse me the cub run cub run stream valley. Um, this is a comparison uh, diagram showing the approved car dealership um, proposal on the left hand side um, that has a, a greater amount of uh, impervious surface, meaning the water can't drain into it, meaning it has the greatest impact on the stream valley. Uh, shown in red is the uh, the outfall area where stormwater that does not infiltrate into the ground on the property uh, runs over towards uh, Cub Run. Um, we've uh, significantly decreased that in the middle of it. That's the data center option. Um, you can see where our overflow um, area is from the, but that first is treated stormwater pond that's shown in blue there. Um, and green is, is the areas of pervious surface where the water can actually um, infiltrate into the ground um, without having to run um, over uh, into the into the pond and, and go into cub run. And then finally, on the right hand side um, is the second option or proposed the alternative option for a warehouse. And you can see where the green and pervious spaces are um, and uh, where the outfall line is uh, shown there in red. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the other thing that's happened uh, in the last month is we've begun uh, working with staff uh, to draft uh, proper commitments that would be designed to address some of the some of the concerns. Um, I know a lot of you raised concerns about the environmental impacts um, from water. Um, it's it's we're we're not certain if this will be uh, a data center that if it's a, if it is a data center, if it would be cooled with a water based uh, treatment system where water would be piped through and cooled down. Uh, the servers in the data center. Um, if it is, uh, we, there, there are no additives or chemicals uh, that are put into water uh, into the water that would be used for such a, a cooling system um, before it would be uh, discharged into the sewer treatment system. Um, my lay understanding is that there would be a higher concentration of salt and bromide in the water, and just from the back, uh, a little bit of evaporation that would occur. Um, from the water being heated, um, but again, we wouldn't be adding any. We wouldn't be dealing with any chemicals or adding anything uh, to the water that be uh, introduced into the sewer system. Uh, we also, so we have a proper that speaks to that. Uh, we're gonna we're proposing a proper uh, that would speak to lighting because I know that was a concern some some raised at our last meeting. Um, we would have to meet all applicable Fairfax County lighting standards. Uh, including full cutoff fixtures and LED lighting for all street lights. So uh, these lights would be more focused on the areas they're trying to eliminate and would have less uh, you know, spillover effect and, and you know, some of the older technology lights that you may see around the county. Uh, stormwater facilities, um, we're designing today uh, to minimize any impacts on cover run in the RPA areas. Um, but we further commit in the proffers as we get closer to the, the next thing that happens as soon as we get board approval uh, for a development plan this year. We then have to go through a site plan process where we drill down further on the engineering of the proposed plans um, and they get reviewed by the Department of Public Works and by Environmental Services. We commit to in the proffer between now and then uh, to identify even more ways in. Uh, uh, Buttress up our stormwater provisions uh, to even further minimize beyond what we're only showing uh, what the, the impacts would be on top, uh, cut run. Um, that's I, I won't go into it, but that's using something called the energy balance method, uh, which the, you know the goal is to mimic uh, water. The treatment of water on the sites uh, would be to try to mimic same conditions you have in its, its natural course is condition state. Um, yes, sir. I thought we had talked about testing from nine to six, but this is nine to nine. Is that a mistake or did you really move the again? Um, yes. 
Yeah, I, I don't know if we if, if we did commit to that. That's something we can we can look at. But I thought nine to nine. My understanding but next year at children will be assumed by that. And adults even might be I just say that that's outside of the normal working habits. Yeah, that's not difficult. Yeah, yeah. And, and they, they were letting Frank on that. Looking at two hours continuous, or you're looking at a total of two hours for a top period. So like an hour, a couple hours off, another hour. I think I think the total total hour per day that you know, in the aggregate. So it could be spread over 30 minute increments, an hour increments. Correct. It would be, it would most like, I would say they'd be 30 minute increments. And so we set up the four generators a day and you stagger that, you know, so that uh, cumulatively you'd only hear it for two hours a day. Um, we I'm would, sorry, just to uh, on that, the noise study that that was done was based on 20 diesel generators, but the whole staff report and the site plan, the application calls for 27 diesel generators. So, which is it? And yeah. why was the study not done on 27? Uh, we, you're, you're correct. I did say 27 in the statement of justification. We, we are going on our plans um, 20. So if we were to add more generators, we would have to amend the plan. We would have to redo the study. Well, the county staff report still has 27. So would that be state maybe then to we'll look at the yes, What side generator? Uh Jamie, can you speak to what size the generators are? Uh, Sam Sam Oh Sam, are you online? Sam? Yeah. Can you can you all hear me in the room? Uh, Sam, can you hear me? Yes. Can Can you guys hear me in the room? Hello. They can hear. They can unmute themselves. I did not mute anybody. I can see it. It's, it's, it's probably uh, awesome. I don't appear to. I will mute it. And, and feel free to type the answer in the chat. I think Jeff can see. Yeah, I'm watching the answer. Uh, as to what size the uh, sure. well, wait, 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 wait. we can hear them online, so it's quite possible that. This is not here. So let me go back to this. The secondary question for that is when you run your diesel generator, how many do you run at the same time? Is it all at the same time? No. We expect no. we stop on 27 with a small period of time. Small max is two hours. Okay. Two hours. So we lost the captain. We lost the person upstairs. We're going to do this. And he may be speaking and we may not hear him. So we're going to put him up as this is the speaker. Okay. So one second. Okay. Uh, is that yeah. like the safety minutes from the last time. Um, and the fact that there are 27 generators. And I'm going to go back to that because this is all about the staff report. And that's what this is based on 27 generators. So if it's 27 generators, then the noise study needs to be done on 27 generators. All, all I can tell you is our, our plans show 20, so that's what we can do. And the staff, the staff the, report all throughout here said. I, I hear you, the staff report, but the the, the plans. I'm I'm just telling you, the plans and the proffers are what the board approved, not the staff report. So the staff report can be fixed. And the person who we identified speak try speaking now. Uh, yeah, can can you hear me in the room? Uh, yeah. Can hear you. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I wasn't sure if I was on mine or in the room. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the generator sound levels that were used in the sound study were based on an assumed size of 2.5 to 2.75 megawatts, uh, which is, I, I think, based on prior experience, uh, fairly, fairly typical of, of uh, the data centers of this size in, in my own. Um, uh, sorry, Sam. So on page um, uh, 18 in here, the says we estimate that the proposed 27 three megawatt generators are needed for option one. So you just said two to 2.5. Uh, I, I, I said uh, the the sound level data that that I that I, I had from some vendors was based on a 2.5 to 2.75 megawatt. Um, but, but typically, the way the the generators are purchased and, and specified when, when they're purchased is, is that. Um, regardless of the sizing, there'll be a sound level specification with them. 
Uh, and so in this instance, these generators were modeled using the sound level specification of 85 decibels at 23 feet. Um, and so uh, essentially that, that, that specification could be carried forward to a generator of a three megawatt size or a smaller generator uh, to ensure that the sound emissions predicted here are, are consistent with what's uh, experienced down the road. All right, thanks, Sam. Uh, follow up question on the generators. Sure. It's not the time. Uh, we'll, we'll get back okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah, almost done here. Um, so, yes, as I said, generator testing limited to two hours per day between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. Um, we also have to comply uh, with the uh, there were some questions about the use of diesel generators and storage of the diesel fuel to power them on site um, and what potential impacts there'd have uh, uh, there could be if there were a spill. Um, we uh, have have added a proffer that says we have to um, uh, comply with, uh, as I mentioned there at the, at the top, chapter 67.1, that deals with, um, it, you know, what can go into the storm source system, what can obviously diesel fuel uh, cannot go into there. We also have to comply uh, with state regulations um, for, uh, from the state water control board that have to do with uh, above ground storage tanks um, of the type that will store the diesel fuel. And uh, again, not a, not to get into the details on those, but they require um, redundancy so that you have a, a chamber to catch any oil that might leak. Uh, so it's kept and contained on site um, so that it can be cleaned up rather than uh, going on to adjacent property or cub run. Um, and, and there are uh, a lot of state regulations in terms of inspections, periodic inspections and certifications um, and testing that need, needs to be done for such tanks uh, to ensure that they're, they're not leaking and they're, uh, they're not polluting. Uh, next slide, please. I think that may be. That's that's it for uh, the presentation. So, like Jeff said, we're uh, we've got the the full team here, uh, including I'm, I should have mentioned Les Atkins, our traffic engineer. Um, so we're happy to answer uh, any questions you have at this point. So before we start the regular question and answer, if you could turn on the back lights, uh, the other one, the one that's better, because that way we can see the screen. All right. And hold on when I take this consideration for the people who will be visiting us. I want them to see this screen the most. So let's put the layout stack. And so this is where well, you're seeing the room as it is now, and you'll see the speakers on the left as they speak. Okay. Now we're going to this now. And Either way. Okay, so as we indicated earlier, we have some questions from the chat. And we have, uh, as I said before, uh, let's say about this. Let me go here. We were looking at these areas. Oh, maybe I need to go back and share my screen. So let me let's see. Okay, so we were talking about this that's on the left, and we have the chat that's also available. And so we're going to be concentrating on the first item, which is land use zoning industrial commercial FCPA. The FCPA is Fairfax State Park Authority, unless I'm mistaken. Do you have another acronym? Yeah, no, I mean, one of the issues that hey, Jim Hart brought up and, and is the deal with cut. Like, are they on board calls? Uh, we, we have had multiple conversations with them. Uh, a, a final decision hasn't been made on the applicant side as to whether we're going to uh, dedicate the land to the park authority. It's our that's likely going to happen. Um, but they're they're um, on. They're very much on board with uh, cub run being or the, the. 
uh, 67 acres that aren't isn't part of the data center or the warehouse uh, being dedicated to the park authority. And as I understand it in the staff report, it's an either or. They either pay $108,000 as a contribution to the Fairfax County Park Authority, or they kind of dedicate the land. But in order to do that, they have to remove all the invasive bamboo and other things. And as Josh indicated before, they weren't willing to do that part of it. So, I'm sorry. So the park pays $108,000. Okay. Yeah, that's that's accurate. Okay, so let's first first talk about land use of and compare it to the commercial warehouse to the Davis. I think you did you did actually mean compare the approved uh, car dealership to we're proposing two options. Right, One day want to compare the current. Yeah, the current currently approved is a car dealership. To yep. the industrial and compare it to the commercial yep. plan is now booked out. It defaults back to the public. Correct. Exactly. Right. So really it's a car dealership. You got two options. Yeah. But what's a car dealership and what a data center slash? Correct. Where else? Correct. But it could default back to the car dealership. Correct. So that's which we wanted to point out that there are three choices now. You have to have an either a warehouse or a data center, but you will have a car dealership or a silver exemption or accessory uses for the dealership there. It's probably not going to be a dealership, but accessory uses by a dealership. So so what was approved in 2020, yeah, was a was a car dealership and then a car service center um, or car servicing. So the question then is. Transportation, parking, access to road trips, and parking spaces. So let's look at those options. Do you decrease transportation, parking, access to road trips, and parking spaces in the data center versus the current zoning? And how is that compared to the warehouse versus the data center? Yes. So the the data center will generate, and and if if we like, we can go back to the presentation we gave last month. We have a a summary slide that will give you the exact numbers, but the the data center will produce uh, far far fewer uh, daily trips uh, than the car dealership slash service center. The warehouse um, will generate more than the data center, but again, far fewer uh, than the the car dealership. Okay, so and I'm the like parking, you know, the number of parking spaces, of course, would would be greatest for the car dealership. Hopefully, amongst those bricks will be the. Uh, Data presentation. The last month's presentation is much a thicker document than the current. Right. See how much longer we stick to the So while that's I, going on, uh, your your access, your ingress, egress, it's through the car dealership. It's not on fifty. Is that correct? Uh, we do have two two points of access. Uh, one will be off of fifty, um, and one will be through. The um, auto park circle uh, complex of dealerships to the east. That'll be our but you said these secondary access. The access will only be used for large delivery trucks, such and such. Well, the people who work they will coming off of the uh, stall truck. How's that work? Auto park. Uh, no, go to the auto. Park. Uh, the, the 50 workers go to the auto park. The em employees, employees, and and smaller vehicles will be directed through uh, auto park circle. Um, lar larger vehicles will have to come in off of Route 50. And it's a ride in, ride out. Correct. Also, fire response vehicles. Well. Yeah, emergency. Oh, yeah, emergency responders. Okay, so I'm looking at these maps here. Uh, here is is this. I'm trying to find which one of the pages has the illustration of the secondary access. It's a uh, numbered slide 20. 20. Okay. Uh, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. 30. If the delivery trucks are okay. from here, the power trucks fast. They have to do a UE and plus valley and do a right in, right out of your access. Is that correct? Yes. I believe really, so. But right. at the westbound, no. they just do it right. Correct. Okay, so he's about All right. I'm going to this chart, which may not be visible to anybody who's not following it along. 
The AM peak hour weekday for the current site is 112. Option one, the data center is 44. Option two for the warehouse is 105. The totals is 1690 on the average daily trips for the current site, 400 for the data center, 700 for the warehouse. Both of those are decrements of what's currently on. So 700 per day are going to be you turning or no, not no, no, no. It's still We've got all the emergency and heavy delivery. No, 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 for the warehouse. No, for the warehouse. You just said that. No, he said deliveries. He didn't say people working. Oh, I'm asking about the, the big trucks. That's not on this job. Oh, okay. What are the big trucks um, impact? We have that, or is this just? This is this is this is all vehicles. I don't I don't know unless I don't know if we have in, uh, numbers on like the, the the question from before was westbound uh, trucks that are westbound um, are going to have to make a U turn to get back um, on the on the warehouse option. They they, they, they may be coming up from sixty six and twenty eight and go up Stone Crawl. Why they're trying to make a U-turn on Route 50, and coming from the south, they won't go up to 50 and across. They'll come up Stone Crawl. Well, we don't know that, Jeff. Well, I'm just saying is that. But what I, I want to know is, don't want to make U-turns. I'm sure they don't it's want to, but if that's their only option, it's not. Then... Yeah, West right. or uh, yeah, yep. hey, Les. Hey, good evening, Les Atkins with Wells and Associates here. So, um, yeah, I believe westbound U-turns are not permitted at Pleasant Valley along 50 anyway. But um, Jeff, Jeff is, you know, on the right track there. They'll be able to lay out their um, their truck routes to avoid U-turns. Um, so they're, they're alternate paths to get to that location. Stonecrook is a four lane divided highway from the interchange at right over here. I can imagine trucks who don't do trucking will not want to make a U-turn, especially if you've never been over 50 to more traffic than this Stonecrook. So, I'm not a trucker by trade, but I was a transportation advisory commissioner for Sully. The preferred way to get to that is up Stone Grove four lane and make the right turn and right turn in rather than trying to come out and do it. And that way, and they'd have to go out to Loudoun County to do the leeway. This, all right, in any case, but the total car, should be the total transportation impact is basically. One fourth of the data center and less than uh, thirty-seven percent compared to the current existing land usage. I just want to um, correct something that Les said. U turns are permitted there yeah. on a Pleasant Valley route. The route they city. will be with truckers again, right. but, but but there is another issue right. Right. on Stonewall. So is east of Beverly Ridge. And they will come up and go to some room. Yes, it's just coming up to uh Dunbridge. Okay, let's go to the next item on the uh point here, which was uh can I yeah on this side transportation back to school. And, and that will tax not at this point, but look at the transportation tax. Well, I'm talking about transportation, but then how's it going to affect bus buses and during school hours and take that? Just dramatically, dramatically fewer trips, potential conflicts with school buses if a data center is built here versus the approved uh, car dealership. Um, the car dealership that made our spots. That sounds right. Right. It's a big traffic generator. So yeah. don't compare it to a no build situation. Yeah, the cost is currently zoned for oil dealerships and accessory uses. That is what you're comparing to. Because if nothing of these, neither one of these two things is cursed, that's the people. So you compare it to the people, not to the fact that there are trees there now. So, so originally it was I3 forever up until the pandemic when they upzoned it to five for part of the dealership. Correct. Right. Okay, so let's go to the footprint for height differences. Uh, so the the FAR um, would would increase. We're proposing point 
0.8 FAR, uh, which equates to a 402,000 um, square foot uh, data center under option one. Um, the car dealership, um, I believe, was more at a. I apologize, I don't remember the numbers, but I think it was it was it was significantly lower. Um, it was, uh, I believe, the dealership building was. I may be getting these backwards. I believe it was a total of 60,000 square feet for both the car dealership building and the uh, service center, because again, it was mostly going to be developed with parking spaces what are uh, the, before. The warehouse? And the, the, the warehouse is significantly smaller uh, than the data center proposal. It's a, about 150,000 square feet. Okay, what about the heights? Uh, the height, the greatest height, the, the trend with data centers has been, and again, I'm not an expert on these things by any means, but the the, the trend has been uh, to to go multi level to to stack these higher um, in a building. Um, so we're proposing a special exception request that would allow us to go up from 75 feet, which is the standard for I five, to 110 feet, including all uh, rooftop uh, so levels. We are familiar with the data centers north of Route 50 that are off of AVR. Mm -hmm. How tall, how big, compare what you're playing to those facilities. I, I do think Cynthia is correct in that I, I'm not aware of any that have been approved in Fairfax that, that are. Built up. I'm sorry? I thought they were approved but not built. There could be some, there could be some that are approved but unbuilt, but I don't think it exists. I, I don't I don't know the answer, Jeff. Is that on? Yeah, the two the data centers that are between Avion Parkway and Stonecroft are seventy five feet tall. That is the maximum allowed, or the maximum that is currently in land unit each for height. This would be one hundred and ten feet. That's thirty five feet taller. So you take half of that building and put it on top of it, and that's how much taller. That's Thank tall. Really, really tall. Okay. Is, is that well, structures on the top of the building as well? So, if it's going to be in a flight path, are there yeah. going to be? Yeah, and, and, and that's a good question. It, it it does, and we do have to. We do have to. Um, we've so done an initial. It is, and, and and we have done an initial assessment to make sure we're not going to run afoul of FAA, and we are going to have to go the next step and do like a full blown FAA sign off. Before we can build anything, so you including including right, the so if it's the twenty foot thing on the top of the roof, that means the roof is not one hundred and thirty feet, but one hundred and twenty feet ahead with twenty feet of the structure on top. No, I'm sorry, it's it's a well, Jamie, you've got your hand up. Are you one hundred and ten included mechanical equipment? That's the highest. All right, so yeah, saying, that's absolute max. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, anything that's on the roof is. Below the 110, correct. And that means the roof of the building will be lower than that if you have to have correct. The main, yeah, the main roof line the main roof is five around nine. That's okay. that's Thank right. Thank you so much. I just wanted to clarify that. So it's yep. not 100 and stuff, it's including that. Room. Correct. Right, I want to add that the Avion ones. So it is 10 people here, which they asked in the back of the room. Yeah, Jamie, come on. So the Avion ones, so it is 75 feet height, uh, but that is not including mechanical. So the mechanical equipment for those can go another 15 to 18 feet. And so you could end up with the 85 million so for okay. the I don't know exactly what this has to be. The next item was electrical power, periodic generator, makeup, the maintenance, and safety inspections. No, I'm sorry, that can't that's safe, that can't be true. Because they would have had to have gone through a special exception to go over the No, no, the 75 feet is to the main roof line. Right, and okay. there is a separate provision. I don't think that's a true statement because they would have to. And I'm saying, no, they would not. They would years. not have to ask for a special exception for right, the rooftop so mechanical to go above 75 feet is not the cutoff. 75 feet is the main roof line cutoff. I can show you, Cynthia, after the meeting. The provision in the zoning ordinance that talks about exemptions for main roof line and rooftop yeah. mechanical. So you're allowed to not count only by the percent of the roof area with mechanical equipment without having to get a special exception. Yeah, it's a separate so section. If the they ordinance. have mechanical equipment on the roof and it's less than 25% of their total area, they are allowed to go up to, I mean, not any height they want, but they're allowed to go up to probably 20 feet. And all they have to do is three above that. If, okay. if, if, I'm sorry, real quick. If, you're, if you are not able to get that special exception to go to 100 and whatever feet, 
would you still look to do a data center at 75? Prob probably that'd probably still be the highest and best. Okay. Um, value. With, the, with the caveat that we do the get both of them on top of it. Okay. De screen that would be blocks. Your fine choice. Right. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. okay, so I have this to chat questions. Some of them pertain to points that you asked for, so we bring this up. And question three from Jim Hall was. The large truck entering site 50 westbound have to make a new turn in Pleasant Valley. And does that conflict with the traffic turning right that would be challenging even now? So uh Les, do you want to chime in on that? I think you answered the questions. You don't think that whether whether U-turns are allowed at Pleasant Valley or not, we, we don't think semi trucks are likely to to come that way if they have to make a U turn. You've seen it. You've seen it. I've seen okay. it first. Yeah. Yeah. It's not fine. And, and it's, it's not going yeah, because at the end they have to back up and block everything. Okay. Yeah. Well, the you know, uh semi trucks would, would be delivering cars to a dealership too. So just keep in mind they don't do that. They can turn on stone. Oh. That's what as we point out, so growth is east of where they need to be. I know, but what I'm saying is if they need if they, let's say they get the uh warehouse distribution center, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, warehouse, yeah. If they were heading westbound on 50, they don't have a way to turn in there directly. So they have to go down further. And they're going to have to go into Loudoun County to make a legal U-turn. Because on Pleasant Valley Road, there are no trucks allowed past the industrial park. So they can't go in and try to go around and come back. Well, past the industrial park, so they can do it. So they can go into the industrial park. There's a semi stripper road to the, on the east side of their valley in the Lafayette business park. There is. You can go there and come out that way. Yeah, there but then they can still do it. They can yeah, do it. They can still be doing, okay. you know, coming down the what, what, what I haven't said is correct. So I want to reiterate that a car dealership, if it's built, those car trucks are still going to have to do that every time. But they do more than what? So you cars car get delivered three to four times a week. They can make I realize that. I've been in the business. I think you hold on. I know. Go ahead. Jay. They can make a left hand turn off of 50 and pull right into the park. So that left hand turn, right in the park. You're not allowed to use auto park circle for large. We're talking about delivery trucks for the cars. Delivery trucks for the cars. Delivery trucks for the cars. Left, left hand turn off of 50 on the stone prop, right hand turn over the park. For, that's what for I'm the existing we dealerships, we're, we're talking about the dealership that we might build. With the dealerships, then we're not going to bring more trucks through auto park, sir. Understood. So our, our dealership cars, which will go down 50, turn around, and come back and use our right hand right. So with what's already been established with the previous rezoning, they know that delivery trucks are going to go down 50, do the turns, and use the right hand right out into the current. So the county's working. Yeah. yeah. If you look at the. Was the question over here? I was going to ask because I, I'm not sure if I missed it. So okay. is there a right hand right out with the current approved dealership deal that's on the table? So yes, yeah, so there's a deceleration lane to slow down to be able to take a right into the site, and then you can pull out and take a right and then go. So the auto block does have access to Route 50 currently. No, we're talking right. about the. We're, yeah, we're talking about the. I'm talking about the current plan. What you said is the auto block currently plan has access off of Route 50. The so currently the currently approved dealership on the on the property is also right turn. Okay, so that's uh, right, right out, right in, right out. On. Whether it's deliveries to the data center, to the auto park, or the warehouse. That access exists today for this plan for today. We're not talking about anything new. Still deliver vehicles. If the dealership is there, their large trucks can use still from. No, so because we have to. to it's no, what they have an the agreement that they have. Right. We, so with the first approved, they they essentially just use the left turn or the sofa. Okay, so no. it's going down further. No, because because we, we don't own that property. We have to have a no, not you, I'm sorry. The, oh. the current. If the current plan is approved, if the current plan, if the current, if if the 2020 currently approved auto park were built, they would not be able to turn left on on Stonecroft or is it Stonecroft or Stone Bridge? Stonecroft. They would not be allowed to because we would have to travel through Auto Park Circle, 
And we have to have a license agreement to do that. And the license agreement we have from the owners of auto, the, the multiple owners of auto parts circle require us to come on off of 50, even if we do, whether we do the dealership or the data center or the uh, warehouse. For the large trucks. For the large trucks. What, what, what can, about that? Several of us are a little confused about that comment because yeah. here's why. We have a concentration of multiple auto dealerships. Yeah. How many are there now? But there is dozen. Eight. All right, eight. All right. You're saying that if under the existing approved development concept for a new auto dealership, the owners of the current auto park would not allow access through their facilities correct over to yours correct and they, so they you just said that was a license agreement doesn't that say that license agreement could probably be renegotiated yes in a tuesday afternoon yes and we got a much better license agreement than our predecessors did our predecessors license agreement says if you get access off of 50 which they have then you can't go through auto park circle and that was one of the first things we had to do with this project is go to Auto Park Circle and say that deal doesn't work for us. We need from the count the county's expectation is we need to have two points of access, one from 50 and one through Auto Park Circle. And so the the Josh's predecessor had uh, an easement agreement that was in the land records that says if you have a means of access off of 50, then you lose the right to travel through Auto Park Circle. And this is for both cars and trucks. Yes. But we're able to negotiate allowing for single occupancy vehicles, employee vehicles to still use our park circle. And what they're trying to do is limit these larger trucks coming through an area that are doing test drives and smaller vehicles. So they try to buy from Dayton. But so the they rather really keep dealerships already. So they have to have the same big trucks that you have. That's right. Buy. And they, they will they they really don't want the dealership because it's competition for them. But they were really yeah. Look at how many dealerships are not in the auto park, but across the street, and just further south, it's a magnet for car dealerships. Whether that's good or bad, it won't go there, right? All right, next item on yeah. this point is yeah. let me call the question. Go ahead. Is that a bona fide dealership, as in Ford, Chevrolet, or whoever? Or was it just going to be a maintenance and distribution center for the vehicles? And so my understanding dealers. was it was going to be a car max. And then when the pandemic hit, cars became scarce. There wasn't a viable business plan. And so that owner decided not to move forward with that user. And then they went to market and they sold the property. Be a car. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I'm speculating because I wasn't that owner. That's what, I, what my understanding is. All right. Okay. Any other questions on this topic? Uh, I do believe that I'm on the same topic. Please, so, uh, uh, my name is Scott Corbett, Pleasant Valley representative, just no, uh, just citizen. I'm addressing this board uh, for the kindness of uh, letting us be here today to talk through this. So thank you for that political statement. Sir, you just made a comment that this is all done in an auto park area. And we've all tried to purchase a car over time. If you go purchase a car, you have to sell this car out of doors. And then I heard you talk about 20 or 27 generators doing 55 decibels. How is anybody going to sell a car? No, 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 no. That is if it's not a car dealership, but a data center. Data. Right. So inside this park, we're bouncing around and citizens are listening, going in three different directions. One minute we're arguing over trucks and transportation, the next minute we're over generators and diesel fuel. If this is centered, respectively, to be a Car viewership, and you have 27 generators run, running. Stop it. If it's a data center, there are no 27 generators. Those are for the data center, not the car dealership. I'm saying that center. Right. There's 27 so, generators running two hours a day, plus the noise of the data center. But then, How do you sell a car outside of your general sales unit? He's worried about the impact on the dealership. I mean, they can speak. And the okay. public hearing if they have an objector. Sure. Then I'll be the, the representatives then on the real estate side of the 27, that's 25% of your day. The sheet you put up starts at 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., right? Yep. Two hours a day. So that's 25% of the residents' day affecting the northwest corner of the property of Pleasant Valley. Is that correct? No, no, so two hours and 12. Yeah, up, up to two hours a day cumulatively. 
testing. Right, computers, yeah. at least. So now we have 27 times 55 decibels acting and compounded. No, 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 no. That 55 was the hearing, no matter how many were running, not individual. Okay, yeah, so it's like a hair dryer running. You're not sure. Well, it's good. I understand, right? Okay. Let's, go, let's go on to this. Is there are other questions that we want to be out of here before they kick us out of this machine? Uh, like Goldilocks tricks that will come in it with the mice and things like that. Okay, so the next item on the agenda was electrical power periodic generator back at the beta safety study. Now we've heard his presentation of that. There were some questions on the chat that I'm going to try to read. Um, will the commit will the applicant commit to using no diesel generators and using some alternative technology for backup power? That's a question. Yeah. So we you didn't say yes. No, I did not. Say, I'm, you I'm said yes. <laughs> say yes. Okay. Yeah. Forget what you want. Next time, reflex. That's a reflex. Don't do that. <laughs> okay. Didn't mean to say yes. We would consider. We we have looked at alternatives. It's my understanding that there are no real alternatives to diesel uh, for 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 this type of data center. Diesel backup generators are are really okay. what so we. Okay. Next question. Thank you for answering that. How often is the diesel fuel delivered? And how is the stream protected from a diesel spill? Okay, so what I can say about that is, is again, we're subject to the state water control board's regulations. Um, I can provide more information on that. They're very detailed in terms of how they get inspected, how they have to be built, how they have to have um, a containment unit to capture any uh, any oil that is spilled, and can uh, in order to contain the spill on site. Uh, to allow time for cleanup before it, it, it leaves the property. Um, I don't know how often the, the diesel fuel is going to be delivered. I don't know if I heard that. I'm not sure. On a limited basis, with the exception, if there is an emergency and there's a long loss of power, at some point they're going to have to replenish their fuel. But we're talking two hours per a, a day, six minutes per generator. And so I have to imagine. No more than maybe delivery. You can not speculate. Maybe so once a month. Let me ask you one question. You said that up to two hours a day. Question is, do these backup generators get tested every day, or do they get tested once a week? There's 30 days in the month. Usually 20 working days. You then take 20 generators and generate and from one a day, generate one a day, one working day, on the 20th day of the month, and generate a 20 or do you? Do it multiple times during the week. I mean, my so understanding is all 20 or 27, however many there are in that two hour period, all of them are tested in their six minute increments. They turn one on for six minutes, turn it off. Next one, and next one. Does and they go that through. happen every day or does it happen once a week, once a month? How often do you test? I think it's, it's, it's user driven. It's when you say bi weekly, is that twice a week or once every two weeks? Uh, my understanding of bi weekly is once every two weeks, but uh, fortnightly. Fortnightly is a better way to say it because otherwise you get the people who don't know the difference between semi weekly and bi weekly. Okay, fortnightly describes it completely. You go to the library, it's fortnightly. You heard in fortnight in the library, you got the book out in two weeks, right? Okay, fortnightly. All right, so in any case, that's the term. But in any case, so we answered that question. The next question is why has the Park Authority not agreed to take the dedication? They, they've agreed to take it if we're willing to give it to them. We also have. There's other conservation groups. There are different ways to do it. And no means of going to redevelop at 67 acres. But we need to make a decision at some point. And it's not going to happen before the board supervisor meeting. Okay. Good enough. That is the primary probably objective. Is that to park. says that the Fairfax County Park Authority wants them to clean up the site before donating it. And that's what Josh said before was that they weren't willing to do that Good. because it's expensive. Okay. And so will the applicants, all right, so the question you hear is what? And where is the hazmat to be removed referred to in the staff? Which goes back to your question. What is what's this, what is the trash in there? There, there, we don't think there's any trash in there. We there is a, a former grain silo from when this was a farm uh way back when. Um there's not any we we have no reason to think there's anything hazardous on the on the property. The, We've done a phase one and phase two report before we bought the property. They're they're speculating that if there is an issue, it's on us to fix it. But there is no issue, so I don't think there is at this point. We've not found anything. Okay, good. Next question. Well, okay. Will the applicant commit to any limitations on electrical consumption or water consumption? 
So we're up to the electrical power system. The question was any limitation on electrical or water consumption? Any no. Limitations? No. Okay. We're not going to create any. Going from there, Bruce, uh, the question over here, yeah. please. There were two questions, and maybe just one. All right, first, John. I was going to say, um, one, will there be a fund set up for cleanups? In other words, will there be funds to decide in case there is a spill? I realize there's all kinds of steps taken, but acts can happen. From the puncture attack, whatever. Will there be a fund set up aside so that there is money set aside to clean up if there is not? I, I, I don't know. I know we're not agreeing to be committed to that, but Josh isn't the end user. Um, can't speak yet. So you know, ultimately, DEQ has recourse. If somebody does something that creates an environmental catastrophe, some sort, they're going to pursue us to the full extent of the law. And then very easily, a bankruptcy can occur, and in turn, they would default on their business and leave it to the public to actively yeah. up. So again, yeah, that's why I ask if there would be a fund set aside for it, just in case there were any issues to have to clean that material up if there is a spill. Okay. Two, what are the uh, testing parameters for around the area just to verify? You know, I would look at the air, but you're going to have AC, we're going to have bullet within them. That's something you're not very easily going to be able to test and verify. Is there any way that you will test on an uh, annual period or something just to see if there's any leakage, anything getting out around the area? Does anybody have any kind of Test plans to test around the area. I'm not looking for a daily, weekly, or even monthly. But something yeah. somebody just going out there and occasionally just taking a taking a toll. Of what was the established levels and what we're seeing after? The I I don't know. I don't. I I don't know what the protocols are for the emissions testing, but I can I can tell you the state water control board does have um, a lot of regulations that the owner operator of the ASTs, the above ground storage tanks, have to follow. In terms of periodic inspections, um, the, the the testing that they need to look for. I think we want you to come over here, James. No, no. I just want you to ask the question. Beyond Again, the scope of the camera, your your voices from the side, and sure. both of you when you speak come into the call. I can't I can't share with you the regulations I've seen that speak to uh, you know the periodic inspections and certifications that have to take place for all those red flags of you know that indicate there's a leak. The last them. question is what kind of automation would you have in the data center to be able to monitor things like diesel fuel levels and freon levels to be able to keep track on be able to trigger alerts if something were to happen you see a sudden drop in diesel or you see a sudden drop in freon that would immediately trigger somebody into action that something is wrong and action has to be taken at that. I, I'm speculating here, but I know that they would have to, uh, again, at least in terms of the, the pressure levels and the tanks and everything, those those will get inspected and tested, you know, frequently. Um, and I would imagine. Actually, for automated testing. Yeah, for automated testing. On site. Like I said, you my, can my, state my, state my, my my guess is that based on the types of folks that Josh is talking to for the potential end user, there's going to be a lot of automated automated um, uh, controls measuring that, every that giveaway. You see things are dropping fast, or you see free hundred. Correct. Correct. It would set off. Correct. Three mile out. It's a good example. Okay. Yeah. Okay. More questions here. Oh, John, you want any questions? Go ahead. Um, and data centers take a lot of power. Yes. And you're probably going to need more transmission lines. You're going to put them underground or above ground? Uh, they would. They would be above, uh, below ground, um, and a new substation would would have to be built. Um, Dominion would have to build us a new offsite power station, um, in as a precursor to us building um, a data center. Would it and be in Loudoun County or Fairfax? It would be in Fairfax County because it would be uh, fairly close. It, 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 oh, it could it, be. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. It could be either one. So ultimately, but you got to be on camera. Sorry, Jamie. Yeah, there we go. It could be in either county, depending on which way Dominion comes. So there's substations down the road on 50 west, and there's substations down the road east. So whichever way they want, they want to tie it in, and where they find the land to do the addition. So I got a good question. 
that's that hasn't been figured out yet. That's what uh, Dominion is working on right now, and we're coordinating with them to try and figure out the best location for that. But then one step station is at the end of Braddock Road and Old Bleed Road. So if do if they have to enhance that substation, where would the lines go to get to? That's the public area. Yeah, yeah I know. That's the Dominion. Dominion would work. So Many would work on that, and I will say that substation that we are going to tie into is not going to be solely for our building. It will be a community substation. It's going to be along fifty now over no, not over Brad. It's going to be, it's going to be along fifty more. Yeah, it's not it's down down that substation on Brad. No, but okay. if it's not going to be just for you. Where the other data centers going? We're doing more down south. Well, it's not just for other data centers. It's for Community use, commercial use, anybody in that. They, it's like a new school. They redraw the boundaries. So. Go ahead, sir. Why is it that we have to? Excuse me. Follow along. And John was talking to the Cambodian. Go ahead. Go ahead. We are to the power get to the substation by the current transmission line to the current transmission line routes. Uh, that that would be. We're we're coordinating with the minion to try and figure that out. Um, but ultimately, as Evan said, from the substation to our site would all be underground. And it would it would have to go through John, it would have to go through the 2232 process for them to, for Dominion to put in the substation. Okay. So there would be that whole extended public hearing the process. To the when I was on the planning commission, I put in the first data center uh in Loudoun County. There was so much pushback from citizens that the board of supervisors in Loudoun voted to put it in the <laughs> But I just hope that uh, they need to get this nailed out sooner than later where the substation is going to be. Okay, so next, so I think it was what to hear first. The question again. This is on electrical power. This, this is on electrical power. Okay. My question is, why are you going to rely on the power companies to put in a power station? What are you doing? You have your own substation right there on site. Instead of relying on Everything else where we end up paying the price as the customers for these companies, whether it be Dominion, whether it be Novak, whoever, doesn't matter. We should not be held responsible for anything. It might mean nothing that data center uses. All right. I agree with you. And, and, and why don't you why don't you incur the cost of putting that power substation right on your property? So that way you don't have to worry about distributing it anywhere else. It's only going to be totally utilized by you. And, and you can purchase it from wherever you want. It doesn't matter to me on that. But number one, well, that's if I and I don't agree with this by the way, with any of this. I think that the county has an issue with the zoning. And we we have worked with Dominion. We have tried to figure out a way to split a substation on our site. But ultimately, through our talks with Dominion and the constraints with the RPA boundary on our site, Dominion and us have figured out that the best location is going to be offset. So I will say that. Well, that's, that's what I'm saying. Dominion shouldn't have anything to do with it. But it should be all substation. Sir, sir, sir. Dominion we, controls the electricity. Yeah, we can't own it. You don't control the electricity on your boss. As much as one might like to, it's up to Dominion. They have the. Well, and no matter whichever one of them, they have the license and the areas. And if you wanted to construct something on your property, they're the ones that have to give you the permission to sit this thing. And okay. that's the problem that you have. Okay. If everybody had their own little thing, probably can efficiently remove it. Right. So it's uh, the, the big boys are playing. And I agree. Okay. So, and it's always the expense to build these things. This is not coming out of the standard user. Basically, the amount of revenue that they generate off of these users. Aims for these, yeah. these, yeah, but they charge us the cost. We figured that out. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> we're the ones running the power ourselves, but um, that's <laughs> not all right. There was a question over here. Somebody else that one? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, right. If you're telling us the truth, I'm assuming you will, that you will pay the capital cost. They're going to go through it. They're going to construct a substation for maybe one data center and a couple of thousand homes. They might do it for several data centers. Ultimately, they're going to size it to be well above our needs and they're going to distribute it as they see fit because that is their business. 
but as part of paying for that, they don't come out of pocket ultimately. They generate revenue. And so the EV is incentivized to build data centers because they make money off the end. Remember, for the people in our committee here, when Amazon built the, it's a building now with a new data center where the EDF copy used to be on Route 28. Right. They tore down the old EDS and they're building a data center. The only thing that came for our body was the 232. 2232. Which took from the data center. And although that data center mainly served the Amazon facility, it also reallocated some of the electricity to other locations. So it wasn't solely that data center electrical distribution points. It was integrated into the broader network of data electrical distribution systems they have. And I, as I pointed out, if they built a new school or if they put it in top one subdivision, they reallocate the map of where the kids and students are coming from. And some of them will come from other areas that weren't necessarily in the area that services it. So you can't say that's a my school because your kids coming from somewhere else. So where Chantilly Highlands has the open school in Chantilly Highlands, people for Franklin farm use. Okay. And so therefore it's not our school. And the same things with distribution centers. They serve the broader public and the Dominion and Novak draw the lines, so it's not their data center. They may, been, they may have been the tip of a camel that caused them to build it, but it's not totally theirs. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, but the point, Jeff, is that if we didn't have a data center, there would not be upgraded data needs for distributions. In the data center, and we all end up paying higher rates to pay for that and both oh, a little bit of it goes to the community. Problem. But my point is, you cannot say it's their data, their distribution for that services. And I'm like, no, I'm not sure I want this. It's an application question. What if they upsize this? Uh, Scott, uh, Pleasant Valley. Once they upsize it to the I five application and the electricals there, and it's three to five years of any of these choices, right? Car dealership, warehouse, data center. What prevents them from converting the application into from a warehouse to a data center? Because they've got to go through the planning commission again. Okay, so they would not apply, but the electricity, I'm staying to the base, the electricity would already be there. But if they had a and they had a data car park dealership or a warehouse, they might not need that data, the electric distribution, and that might not be built. So if they have a warehouse or a car park, then they do the go back and Dominion go away and have these things open up and build one. Right. It's right. A B. So what you're saying is if they have the other two plans and they revert to this one, they come through this whole to the go-go again, and then Dominion and Nova have to do the whole fucking planning again. If they come over first two, they don't. Okay. Well, that was kind of what his comment was to mind that the one as chicken in the egg has to develop in electricity land for one of these operations to begin. Right. And there's always has to be electrical. All right. So the next question is, and I think this is something you covered. On the slide where you had the incursions into the RPA, is the red line on the side a proposed intrusion into the RPA, even if it is reduced? Do you still propose an outflow into the street rally? Yes, but yes. Yeah, so um, on those slides, we have the three options. Oh, yep. <laughs> on those slides, we have the three options the car dealership, the data center, and the warehouse. Um, if you remember on the slide, the car dealership was all the way to the left. They had impacts for. Uh, stormwater outfall as well as sewer that they were going to tie into on the other side of Cub Run. Um, for the warehouse and the data center options, our only impacts are for our stormwater outfall. Um, so what you're going to, you're really, the only thing you're going to see is about 50 to 75 feet of a culvert tying into a tributary that ties into Cub Run. Um, everything else will be piped and will be over land. So if you remember, uh, it's on the it's on the other one, one but here. yeah. It's so here. that's so the card. Data center. It's cut back those. Yeah. Yep. So, okay, this is our old presentation. So yeah. 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 Yeah.
Better. So, okay. so there's a there's a tributary. Yeah, so if you're walking down Route 50, there's a V dot stormwater pond right in front of our site. That V dot stormwater pond has a little channel that ties into Cub Run. We're tying into that channel that ties into Cub Run. So here is the map. We're both yep. data center, the warehouse tab. This one, but the approved charge dealership has two, and you have more runoff on the approved cost. Correct. Dealership, yeah. right? Yep. More impervious area on the car dealership. Um, more impact to the RPA. Also, the yellow area that you're seeing on there, that's wetlands. Uh, they were going to impact that as part of the car dealership. Um, we have removed that impact to the wetlands. Um, and the other thing that you can see, so it kind of looks like a snake um, that runs through the red area. That is a trail easement that we're dedicating to the park. So um, trail further south can tie in up to Route 50. Um, and you wouldn't have to walk through any stormwater. Basically, our stormwater pipe would run underneath that, so you would never see it, and the outfall would be on the other side of that trail. Okay, here's another question. Are the regulations that Evan was referring to, is the minimum required regulation supplying to any diesel fuel storage county side, or is there anything additional because this is an environment and sensitive stream valley feeding into the rest? So on the the state water control board, that's all based on the size and the amount of fuel. I don't think there's anything special due to proximity to the stream valley. Okay, so I think that I've, asked, I've covered all the questions from the chat that people have written. But going back to our agenda, we covered the electrical power and safety inspections, noise, roof coolers, noise, contours, periodic noise studies. So we talked about the noise. You talked about the 55 dB in the lines. You showed us the noise controls. How often are you going to have, do you plan to have periodic noise studies? So we, we are having to proffer to do a pre-construction acoustical analysis to, to drill down on exactly what uh, measures are going to be, construction techniques and measures are going to be taken, and what the impacts are, and then we have to do a post-construction um, acoustical analysis after Construction's complete and the data center user has moved in and is doing all the things that make noise, running the air conditioners, et cetera. We have to do, uh, they're going to have to do a post um, construction acoustical analysis to make sure that all the predictions are borne out and it's not noisier than expected. Go ahead. Regarding the uh... the diesel generators, would there be any benefit? To put in some sort of a fence to to uh, so so these are so the way the way the site is designed um, so the generators uh, we have to grade that and it grades actually towards the building and then there's a trench that it, it catches everything catches all the stormwater and runs off um, what is installed in there is called an oil water separator uh, basically if any oil it's or diesel fuel gets in that trench it's all blocked and the water is let out for the from there so we catch all of that in a containment area by grading our site away from the stormwater and then allow the water to exit out of that i think he's talking about north offense for noise. yeah so the, are you talking about for noise or for diesel? oh sorry i thought you Oh, noise for the diesel generators. Right. So, so for the um, generators that we have right now, those are in containers. Um, what we talked about the biweekly testing is ran with the doors closed. Um, so, as Sam talked about, uh, I think he said 85 decibels um, is what those are ran at when they're tested. Um, there are ways uh, that when it's Sam, do you know when the, is that 85 decibels with the doors closed or the doors open? That would be the doors close, uh, presumably, uh, unless the vendor specification states that the, the sound level specification is with the doors open. But but typically, it would include um, the enclosure if it has supply with the doors closed. So the generators are already inside enclosures. And exhaust. No exhaust. Exhaust That's correct. Correct. We, we, have, we have air quality that we have to meet as well. So. Still, you're still exiting sound out of the exhaust. It's like a diesel truck. You can say it's noise. I'm I'm having a little trouble hearing um, uh, from the speaker in the back, but but typically the the generators 
are rated for the sound emissions inclusive of the the exhaust. Uh, and so the exhaust would typically have some kind of muffler on it, like you know you would on a, any diesel engine. And um, who does the studies? When you said, I'm sorry, and uh, pre and post, um, pre and post uh, construction. So you've given us a noise study that's only on 20 generators. We have this now requirement that or it's not a requirement if i'm reading the staff report correctly they recommend that you proper to do pre-construction post-construction uh analysis but is that performed by the same company who did the 20 generators instead of 27 or um it, it, it the the proffer that we've drafted and given to staff doesn't say who's going to do the who, who the engineer or the testing company is going to be um the proffers do run with the land, so it's whoever owns the property and is trying to develop it will be the one responsible for hiring the firm, um, and, the, and it will be up to the county whether they accept the credentials of that, you know, whether they think that's a valid noise study or not, you know, in terms of, like, whether the company has the right credentials and, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, so, so uh, just to add on to that, the, um, in the noise study that we were provided, uh, the during emergency operations, number one, can you just describe what emergency operations really mean? Yeah. And number two, um, they do exceed the thresholds for noise. They go over 60 decibels. Um, so, but that the county considers that, oh, it's not that bad. That's only three more decibels. <laughs> um, so can you explain first what emergency operations truly mean and then explain why if it's exceeding the noise level that you know you, you feel comfortable with that? Yeah, so you're you're right. There is an exception for emergency conditions. And what emergency conditions are is I and uh, Sam Sam, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, so so specifically in the, the Fairfax County Code, they refer to the emission of of, of sound. Um even a power outage by backup generators. Uh, I, I don't if I have the, the, the regulation in front of me here. Um, but uh, the operation of, here it is the operation of backup generators during power outages resulting from storms and other emergencies. Um, so I, I don't know how often the power goes out down there, but it, it would be in the event of an outage that, that, that can maintain power to the facility. Would that mean if like you can't get enough electricity from the grid, that's considered an emergency operation? That's it. Yes, but the only time that we're not going to get enough power, the only time we're not going to get enough power from the grid is if there is a an emergency from some natural disaster or a power outage. That so if the power goes out at your house, the power is going out of the data center. There would never be an instance where the power went out at a data center and not your house. Uh, okay, I guess I'm not I'm not understanding that in the sense that like the DEQ tried to get a variance for loud in Prince William and Fairfax County to allow data centers to run their generators much more than the two hours because they knew they weren't gonna be able to get enough supply from the grid. Now that variance failed because people were very upset about that. Um, so I'm just trying to understand then if you can't get enough just yes or no, if you can't get enough um, electricity from the grid, you will have to run your generators as an emergency operation. Yes, but we will never move forward with building a data center if we don't have permanent power. And so the play is into if we don't get a, a, a distribution point from a substation that meets the whole 50, 60 megawatts that we need. We wouldn't just build the data center and say, we're just going to run 24 7 on a generator. It's not a good business plan. I don't think that's the point. That's, what happens that's if there's a brana? Brana. Yeah. What happens if there's a brana? And all yeah. of a sudden, there's a strain on the system. Mm -hmm. and you guys have to turn your generators on because the grid cannot provide power to all the users because of whatever's going on. Right? We're, we're 90 degrees for 14 days in a row. What happens? You have to turn on your generators. That's right. an emergency situation. You can't cool your, 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 your equipment. You can't continue to run your equipment. You have to resolve to turning on your generators. Now they're on for 12 hours a day. All during the day when there's there's no power. You look at what happened out in California. That's exactly what happened out there. Have you heard you about that? that? No. I mean, that's California, yes. Um, so, 
If, if you have a crystal ball, I certainly would like to look at it. Me too. Because uh, I'm not, I can't come up with this scenario. We, there is no scenario that we believe that it would be a long term outage. It would be it would it would be weather related. They DEV wouldn't agree to it. I don't know that the county's policy, but I don't think they have approved site plans that don't have adequate facilities where it is intended that there is going to be brownouts on a regular basis. Sure, Are there brownouts on the other night? So well, sure. we do have the years ago when when the infrastructure was a lot less than it is now and the policies are a lot more vetted where you can't just do the it. Point, you know, it's I, I will say the point is taken. We we do have to rely on the electrical utility providers to do their job in the state. We don't have an answer to that. If they if they drop the ball, if they can't power the grid and, and you guys lose lights, yeah, the generators have to have to run. But I, I will say to, to the point Cynthia raised about the DEQ applications that were filed, Dominion has had trouble keeping up with data center demand in Northern Virginia. What Josh is what Josh is saying is that he's not going to move forward and he's not going to have a deal with an end user. That they're they're having constant discussions with Dominion. Dominion has to satisfy the people he's trying to do business with that they've got that crap figured out. <laughs> like that's what he's saying. It's like. He, he's got a lot of money riding on this, so he has every incentive to make sure that the situation that caused them in Loudoun and Prince William and, and, and Fairfax to seek this waiver from DEQ, like we're you're doing everything you can to guard against that. But at the end of the day, yes, Dominion does have to provide power. Yeah, but, and we appreciate that you're only dealing with this one application and this one data set. But we, we are regularly I know there's and a lot there are coming. Lots of applications coming up yep. before us that we keep reading about, and they want to build like 300 of them. Yep. And so I, it's it's a, a concern to us how how this region is going to deal. Yeah. With this issue. No, and 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 that's an absolute valid concern. Mm -hmm. I just wanted you guys to know that I'm not privy to them, but Josh and his team that doesn't include me are having quite a few conversations with Dominion um, about. Because he's got a lot riding on them doing what they're saying, which is delivering a new substation and, and being able to not just solve for this data center, but they've got to obviously too, just like the planning commission does and the board does keep up their eye on the ball and, and look at the whole picture. Yes, sir. Keep in mind that you all have the fault. The car dealership, absolutely. No, no. Now, if your car goes out, you can turn on a generator. We don't have that luxury. I can assure and you. We're, 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 we're Trying to guarantee ourselves yep. electrical power to our house. Yep. Knowing that you all are going to suck the power out. And if the end of back up, we ain't got a back up. Yeah. All I can say too is that, again, the people he's trying to do business with do not have a business plan that involves them running those generators a, a single minute longer than they have to. So, you know, they're, they're in the same boat you are. They don't want brownouts, they don't want to be running those generators. Any more than you guys want to be hearing them, and they want reliable power just as much as the the homeowners do in the area, for sure. All right, going on to the next item. Wait, uh, no, I, 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 I wanted to ask this question of Samuel um, for the actual um, generation for the uh, generators and such. Um, the 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 noise when the generators are running for maintenance. Um, you said that if the doors are open, they would be loud. If the doors are closed, it would be not as loud, right? And I do think they, that, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Then, and do they run them with the doors open then? I, I'm not really aware of the operations schedule, uh, frankly. Uh, I know it may vary depending on the operations team that eventually inhabits this building. Um, okay. I, I don't know why they need the doors open personally, but I, I don't know much about the air emission side of things. The noise study then um, that was provided then, in your opinion, um, with the trees in the, the uh, winter time having loose, lost their leaves, mm -hmm. uh, is the study uh, that that the noise study was it done based on having this tree buffer there or or having no. So the in, in in my experience the 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 reduction of noise you might get from a wooded area is is very is minimal, uh, and then especially in a climate like this where the trees, as you say, do they, they lose their leaves, it's not a reliable. You can't rely on the, the sound attenuation from forests. So 
Uh, we assume basically it's clear ground directly from the generators to anywhere the noise is going to. Okay, so including the topography. The topography is is accounted for, but not the trees. Okay, because we are above, our building is above, so we'll be we'll be more in line with those rooftop HVACs and uh, that kind of thing. So you're saying that that's not the noise study does not take the tree buffer into account. That's right. There's there's no accounting for the trees in this in this noise study. Okay, next item on the list there. Lighting, perimeter, evening, night hours. Can you discuss the lighting on the data center, the car dealership, and the warehouse? Yes, so the as as you can visualize, the lighting on a car dealership is gonna mean, you know, be intended to illuminate the whole parking area for security reasons to illuminate all the uh the cars, the inventory, um, you know, for, for security reasons. The, uh, the the lighting will be far more targeted in the, the data center option. As I mentioned, we're uh, proffering to provide um, LED specific point lighting. So there will be perimeter lighting. Um, there will be uh, some focus lighting in the um, in the parking areas and on the building. Um, but in some, it'll be far less significant than the car dealership. And similar answer for the, the so warehouse option. Sign that says this is the data center that flashes every every five seconds. No, okay. not planning on that. Okay, good enough. Just one. I didn't think so. Uh, water consumption, add the three. So there will be more. Uh, so the, the water consumption is largely turns on whether the data center will be water cooled or air cooled. Um, we don't know which it'll be, but I've been told that it's more likely than not going to be air cooled. Um, so it would not be the dramatically higher uh, water consumption that that is associated with data centers for cooling. Uh, bug engines running is what you're saying. <laughs> so, okay, uh, beetle, beetle. And I uh, do want to add in one thing with there. So we've had multiple conversations with Fairfax County Water, um, and so there's a 12 inch line that runs down Route 50. Uh, it's got sufficient pressure and size for our data center if we do end up doing water children. Um, they ran that in, in their model. We have to model it to them and show that we are not hurting that line and reducing pressure anywhere else. So we can't build a data center that's going to steal too much water and not allow you to have fire pressure at your house. So thank you. So okay, now next up, go ahead. That water is starting to wave or can go back up. So it's circulated a few times um, and then it's sent back out and sent into the sanitary sewer system down to the water treatment facility. Is that the question? Um, is that a, is there a chemical discharge into the sewer system or water system? Uh, is the water contaminated when it goes through your cooling system for any use? No, the lot, there's no chemicals added to the water cooling system. Um, it is ran through and then regulated before it goes back into the sanitary sewer system. So we're not doing a massive blowdown into the system with 100,000 gallons. And is it considerably warmer water? With an average impact work, if the average temperature was 55 degrees to 60 or 70, the water coming out is superheated or something like that? No, it's it would never be it would never be superheated, it would be colder. So the whole whole point is to chill everything. So it's going to be colder water. Um, but there are no there's not going to be any adverse impacts to downstream sewer lines. Um, we've worked with Fairfax County Sewer as well on that. And they've analyzed our sites to make sure it can handle all the systems that we're planning on. There's a question over here. Can you stand up? I don't want to stand. Come on. Um, okay. That is sound. Uh, I'm Yvonne. I'm a neighbor of Pleasant Valley. Um, I just wanted to ask, and I apologize, I'm jumping back too quickly when through the lighting, but I did want to ask when will you know, based on FAA standards? What the lighting will be on the rooftop, like how high it'll protrude, if it's going to be flashing, how many lights, like what will so, we be able to see that visibly, obviously from the neighborhood? Yeah. What does that impact? Yeah, so once we file with the FAA, they will let us know uh, criteria of what we need to put on our roofs for incoming plane traffic. Um, I don't know for sure right now. I, we are not expecting to have to put any red flashing lights on top um, of our buildings for that. Um, but ultimately, that would be determined by the FAA, and they'll let us know what we need to put on top. And that would be that would be something we'd we'd obviously have to do pre-construction. So that would that would take place during the site plan phase. So 
Presumably, yeah. we'd know the answer to that. So. Yeah, ultimately, we have to have our FAA permit 45 days before starting construction. So, um, before we even get site plan, the Fairfax County will make us have that FAA permit to show them, hey, look, this is what we have to install on top of it. Thank you. Well, by the way, Mr. Pierre, my question is basically we were talking about what. What is the plan for when you need recycled equipment? In other words, generators, air conditioning, and computer equipment. How is that being handled? Is it being left outside? Is there a payment area for that? Is it going to be exposed to the elements? Because again, computer equipment has to stay as bad chemical capacitors can start popping and other things. So I'm just kind of curious what your recommendation plan is to protect that and dispose of it accordingly. Um, so typically we, we don't have a confirmed end user yet, but most end users, if they do water pool, um, they have uh, tanks that sit outside next to the building. Um, usually they're double wall tanks that handle the flow. Is that what you're asking about? No, sir. Sure. What do we do with the equipment for top of it? Like, oh, the yes. oh that, that's ultimately up to the end user. So um, the end user is not going to want, they want these sites to be clean. If they have a generator that's bad or they have um, some computer equipment that's not functioning, they're not just going to set that to the side. They're going to take that and haul it off to the dumps. Or the appropriate place that it goes. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add too that um, if if they did want to do that, which I agree uh, with Jamie, it's not going to be in their best interest for a whole variety of interests to like put the old servers out until they're picked up. But uh, code enforcement, I, I definitely have plenty of clients who put things out in their parking lots, and the phone doesn't need to ring but once before code enforcement is out there and they're motivated to get the stuff out of the parking lot very quickly. Well, again, yeah, these we will easily see because most data centers have a protection fence around them. It's not something we'll easily see. Yeah. That's again why I ask what the rules are as far as the reclamation of that equipment when it comes time. Yeah, this equipment is highly sensitive and very proprietary that they don't want it to be out there for even that reason. Obviously, environmental considerations, but they they don't want anybody to have access to it in any capacity. Um, a lot of these things are government servers. Or they can obviously be things that other people have access to the technology that they would want people to have access to it. So um, it's a security thing for them more and, and the environment. You need to step forward. Just go ahead. You're back. I'm going to stand, <laughs> stand on the other side. Stand on the other side. Okay. See what I'm saying? All right. Any other questions? Let me get one. Um, how often do you clean your children? What do you do between? Uh, so that's that's end user specific. Um, I am not sure about that in terms of the end user, um, but ultimately they're going to want to keep it clean so they're not breaking down. So, but yeah, but ultimately they would when they clean that they're not going to flush it into the sanitary sewer system. They have specific regulations that they have to reply that they have to follow. We have to treat and test it before they are released. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The last item here. So you discussed the environmental impacts in Stream Valley. You're saying there's going to be one outflow, which is less than what was currently planned. Correct. Right. That's right. The the, the impacts of the EQC um, and and the RPA are dramatically reduced based on Jamie's design um, and staff. You know, told us from the very beginning that they wanted us to do better. Uh, than the approved car dealership, uh, and and we've done that. So, so we, oh, she we, <laughs> we have to we have to actually meet forested condition. There we go. We have to meet forested condition is what we are are telling Fairfax County. So what that means is what is currently out there right now, we have to meet that or exceed it. So it's either going to be better than it currently is, or existing what it currently is. Thank you. All right. I think I've covered the 10 or so points that we have. What is this going before the planning commission? So the sad news for us is that we had been hoping for a June 28th uh, planning commission uh, hearing date. We had a snafu with the reaffirmation of the affidavit. Um, and now we are waiting to hear from staff about the earliest available date, uh, next available date at planning commission, which I'm told is likely going to be July 19th. But we're still waiting for the final word on that. Which is three days after our next our next meeting. Today being the night will be the 17th of July. So the question I have for the body. What do we think? Are we good? Okay. We make some thoughts. And we're comparing the car dealership to your 
how they can go out. From, I think, these folks' perspective, you look at a car dealership, relatively low noise, and the car dealership, very unintuitive. For the most part, no lighting issues. So the down scope lights, they may be brought 20 feet, but they'll be pointed down. So they will see more interact. Can't be seen from their homes. Less intrusive. Limited use of electric and water from our point of view. You point out maybe a little bit of problems with water uh, being discharged from the area of the chemicals being discharged. There's no cost to us for the water increase, no cost of water, no loss of electricity. For us, because of the thing. So, why would we want to have your option versus letting revert back to the car? Well, if you if you want to get into the economics, the the tax revenue generated by data center is Diminished. is multiple higher. Multi, no, it's it multi returns. Yes. I mean, I'm just a humble hundred million dollars in tax revenue. I mean, there's a reason why Loudoun County bends over. I mean, maybe they're doing it wrong. I don't know, but uh, that's that's not what we've been told by the what the experts. The, the environmental. Well, I don't usually go to environment. I don't I don't usually go to an environmental advisory council to get my economic data. Well, I know, but this has to do with it. He says because meeting the expectations of the we county, can get you data. We increase the cost of data centers so the county should expect data centers to seek concessions from the county so that the county will be in competition with other jurisdictions. We're not getting any concessions. Well, if you say that now, but again. I mean, I can tell you we're not in touch with the state government to get any, I mean, any kind of you know tax uh, favorable treatment or, or anything. The county would be willing to do anything to keep this data center. Okay, well, just I'll, I'll say to you, just as we have to have a little bit of faith that Dominion is able to deliver power. I mean, as a land use applicant, like we can't defend if our government is so corrupt that they can't, you know, do the numbers right and they think they're going to make money off this deal, but they're actually not. And that maybe some future user after us, like, get some sort of, um, you know, corporate welfare or tax incentive deal. Like, like, we don't have any control over that. All I can do is I can tell you as their land use attorney. We're not getting any, they're not doing us any favors. Quite the contrary. This is quite an expensive endeavor uh, to go through this rezoning process. And everything that I've been told and we've been told, and that the reason we're here is because this is going to generate a lot of money for the end user, which results in a lot of money for uh, taxes for Fairfax County, which is one reason why a few years ago, Fairfax County Board of Supervisors amended their policy plan. To allow us to do what we're doing right now to incentivize more data centers, because it is a cash cow. That's why uh, Loudoun County has so many data centers. That's why Prince William did this whole digital gateway thing. It is a huge money maker and it decreases the stress that has that the county government has to make up for in taxing its residential property owners. And the third school fire response. Okay. So what you're seeing here is the count of balance. Over the environmental impacts, impacts to the economic impacts, and it is up to us as citizens to decide which is which. There was a series of data centers not too far from the old Redskins farm. You've ever been up in that area? And in fact, they came to us to build the data centers for the Redskins farm. We recommended a change to the name of the street. Because it was the Washington football team at that time. And we said, you don't want to have to address the Washington, the Washington Bets in the But they built that there. They ripped down office buildings to build the data centers of Oregon Islands. Uh, and Westfield's development, not too far from here, up and off of Conference Center Drive. Or the park, so I think it's the the street. Mm -hmm. There were a, a couple of parcels that were vacant 30 years, and they came to us, and I think they actually told, they might have torn down a building or such to rebuild data centers on parcels that were vacant because that was an economical use of the land. And I think it's not too far from uh, the communities off of Route Braddock Road. And the stream valley that goes through that area. And that's to that. 
I'll get to you in a second. So these items are not just land use cases, they're economic cases for the county. Uh, the county has always said that the chief driver of taxes in the county, half of the budget is school budget. And the single driver for the school budget is single family and low density compassion house. Those are the houses that are more likely to have children, which are more likely to need services in schools. So town, that town has large sum of apartments, multi-family family apartments, have less children per residential unit than do your houses, my houses, Franklin Park, and the other houses. Therefore, they're happy to have the higher density residential and the commercial industrial, because A, as it's pointed out, they don't have as much traffic, and they don't have as many children. And the traffic drives roads, and the children drive schools, both of which cost the county and cost us as taxpayers. So they look friendly on this, they look happily on this because as far as they're concerned, it's a cash cow. And that's what you see in Loudon. Plus the fact is under the airport right ways where there's a high noise, what better building to build than a building that doesn't have people listening to the noise. So these are things that they're happy to have done. And this plan is in a runway area, is it not? Yes. Is it south of the north? Which one of the runways is south of? Uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly. I want to say it's three, but I, I don't know. All right. So there are two, there are three north-south runways currently at Dulles Hampton, one of which was just recently built, right? The runway, they're planning to build another east-west runway sometime in the future. That hasn't been planned. It's been planned and approved, but not built. So on some afternoons, you can look, but there are three planes going north or south as the case may be planned. It's impractical to have residential there. I'm certain that you and Cover Island are familiar with that noise, right? We in Shakespeare Highlands here are going east west. So they are happy to have usage where the noise does not impact its usage. Okay, so then there's just a second, some questions here. How much stuff this morning? You sir. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, I'm Keith Elliott. Yeah. I am Keith Elliott. I live in um, here in Centerville. I'm not in the Pleasant Valley. But I just want to say that you're absolutely correct. It is a cash cap, right? And if we look at Loudoun County, where all those data centers are, you look at a high rise, you look at a 100 foot building or 80 foot building, right? And it's abutted right up, right? There's things that I think the data centers and, and the billion dollar corporations, right? The county lives off us just as residents, right? So it's basically the county should be a nonprofit. Sometimes I don't think the county is a nonprofit, to be quite honest with you. But I think that for the aspect of the residents itself, we're talking about the communities, right? So if we're talking about the communities, we want to protect their assets. It's basically for a lot of us, they're the biggest asset that they got. So I think a lot of it comes with, I guess it's going to come from the site plan. But I think if you could put some of that stuff in there to protect the communities, like the noise, you could have sound balls. Top. I know you have to air, have to have air, right? But you can have cell balls that are solid, so that maybe adjacent to the parallel that runs through the pleasant valley. You know, so there's things that billion dollar corporation could do on behalf of the county and on behalf of the residents would be great. I think that's what we're That's what you're going to get. just curious from one aspect, not to roll again, plus value. Um, with this, you kept talking about the person who's going to take control of the site. Is this a turnkey version, or are you going to maintain the property from here on out, or is this going to be turned over to somebody as a purchase turnkey solution? Uh, to be determined, whoever ultimately owns and operates the, the property, you just don't have the same property requirements we would. Are you going to lease it to them, or will they buy it from you? They, they could be any one of them. So both of those are options. Okay, I understand. Okay, over here. As the land uh, owner from that, and you're the attorney for this, and there's over the I-5 potential developments that would affect the boundary of Pleasant Valley. Does your firm or your firm, are you representing any other applicants 
for options on the land to make this term key or footprint solution into other I-5 zones? And then would you up, try to special upsize it to be outside of the Chantilly boundary of 70 uh, feet? Because you're asking for this special uh, application. So we had one go in, you'd have two or three on the move. I think I understand. Have you been retained by anybody specifically for that? No. When this client expand, their thought process can stay at the first one and move to this. I, I, I will tell you that what what's this was what I was trying to get at earlier in the evening is yes, sir. And, and these guys know better than I, but this this trend is gonna be taller data centers, I think, is where the technology and the, the demand is going. And I can't articulate exactly what the reasons are for that, but I've just been told that this that the the the, the footprint we're looking for with the taller building is what I'm being told, you know, is going to be more the norm uh, going forward, just because that's what these end users um, are looking for to, to build what they, they need to build to house these these servers. But no, I, I don't have any other pending applications. I'm not aware of any other applications that have been filed uh, in the in the area or elsewhere in Fairfax County um, right now that are they're seeking this additional hype. But that's just because I'm not aware of any, and I've looked. I'm not aware of any other pending. Uh, data center cases. I know that a lot of folks in this room are familiar with one that wasn't technically a data center case, but it was the Mason district thing where the landowner refused to rule out the possibility of it being a data center at some point. Um, but, but that's all I know. It's pretty easy for us to follow the question. You said this is cash cows, the applicant that you provided a forecast of the cash tax base that you provide to the county in this 110 foot. Well, we don't no, we don't rent. we don't do that as applicant, but I'm I'm just saying that the, the county does analyze that as you know the the um, fiscal impacts of, of land uses are considered when they do things like amend their comprehensive plan um, and and do things like adopt ZMOD. You know, they do take these land use economics and the consideration. Right, but it would be easy to put an MBA hat on it and say if I lose two percent of my home value in air, two percent of my home value in water, two percent of my home value in equity, to this man's point, it's the largest stock I own. Right. So if I if I got two percent overall appearance, right, which is trees, boundaries, visual, I'm an eight percent. Let's just call ten percent across the board. Average home plus the value sixty five six hundred and fifty thousand dollars, some more. So I can take that times 545 homes and say that's $35 million in economic redu reduction in homeowners value by having your building inside my boundary of where I live. So if I even get an application for a 30 year mortgage, I plan on living there for a time, raising my children, being part of that community. And now you're just coming here as one individual, taking it away from 545 people. Somebody has to have done an analysis that could be shared in the community, either as my government or as the app. Do anyone have that information? I, I don't know if the if county staff has done that for this specific application. They, they do not do that on a regular basis ever. Okay. And the public hearing that's coming up that's been postponed as we just heard. Is your opportunity to speak to that point? Okay. It's no so that point will be taken and assist. Just personal, personal experience. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. It's a valid point, but in the general scheme of things, this is a benefit for the county. Okay. Not necessary for us. Sir, man. Um, so we've talked about, you know. Basic noise for the duration of the building is there. What can we expect versus what is currently approved and the two options that you are um, implementing for construction? First of all, clean up, then construction. What's that time frame look like, and what's the difference between what's to be built or what could be built? Um, so, just talking in in general terms. A lot of the construction costs, uh, I mean, there will, it, it will take longer, obviously, to build a data center than it would take to build a, a car dealership. Um, probably the warehouse would take about as much time as the data center, just because you have a lot of the same 
mobilization issues and construction and the fact that the building is is uh you know less than half the size for the warehouse probably doesn't move the deal very much um what i'm always what i've always been told again just as the land use attorney is that um you know we we, we go through this entitlement process the site plan approval process that you've got to go through to get all these permits typically takes somewhere give or take a year and then the actual construction is pretty quick like a data center and a warehouse are not involving a lot of uh, masonry and construction so they don't take as long to build as like a office building or uh, an apartment building especially if you have like below grade parking so we wouldn't have any below grade in, uh, construction so that would decrease the amount of time um so the noise the noise with construction it's obviously there's going to be that consistency with the generators and, and so forth but so I, I will say that I will say um, as from doing this, the construction noise that most people are bothered by the most it are the piles when you're doing um, below grade construction below, to build below grade parking, and you have to shore up the size of the big hole you're building, um, and you, you bring in these big machines that drive the piles down that are ultimately going to hold up the parking the cement parking garage on the ground, and then. A building on top of that, that's generally the loudest uh, feature of construction that people complain about the most. We're not going to have any of that with a data center um, or with uh, a warehouse. Um, and you certainly wouldn't have that with the car dealership. So there wouldn't be that. But yeah, you're going to have the other, you know, sounds of, of construction vehicles coming in and out. Um, again, I will say that compared to some things that get built in Fairfax County, data centers, um, the outside frame is pretty quick to go up and then it takes a lot longer to do all the stuff they need to do inside that, that doesn't generate let, let much me, noise. Let me you had a map of the EDA contours. Yes. Was that the maximum they had? That was the maximum during normal operations and then the maximum during um, uh, maintenance uh, operations. So the yeah. maintenance operations. Wait, maybe Sam, do you want to minute? But the test of the generators is the maximum noise. Is that right, Sam? Uh, I, I was going to make one note is that when we say normal operations, that's it may be more accurately defined as like fully, uh, fully, uh, full speed operations. So on a day, I'm in, I'm in Kansas City and it's about 92 degrees today. So on a day like today, maybe all the fans would be running, but they wouldn't be running all the time uh, every day. This is a kind of a worst case, everything running. At full speed, uh, so that's what we're considering normal operations here. And then on top of that, for the maintenance operations and emergency operations, we've assumed similarly that all the equipment is running, all the you know ventilation and cooling equipment is running at full speed, as it would be on like a hundred degree day. So it's kind of a worst case prediction. So what you're saying is that that average for non-emergency and the average for emergency is not going to happen on an average, but it's the extreme cases so. exactly yeah it's it's everything that could possibly be running would be running in the emergency case that's you know everything yeah. running full speed so that, that would be like the very the day, worst case scenario they're running as full noise as it can be and it's 110 degrees outside you're gonna be able to smoke it'll be a little bit better it's and sam your study doesn't consider the additional sound dampening if somebody were in their home right because you don't know the, the location no of this is ex external external exactly right so it, it would just be in the exterior area noise um would you consider having those homes that we know are going to be in the higher decibel range especially when it's emergency power they're going to exceed that would you consider providing uh, noise sensors and monitoring equipment for those homes. Uh, I mean, I appreciate the fact that you do noise studies and stuff, but we don't really have anything concrete to say this has been happening for three hours now. It's driving me and my dog insane. Um, would you consider providing equipment to those homeowners? I, I, I don't. With, with all in all honesty, I, I don't know that that would be workable to hand equipment to them. I mean, we we feel like we've addressed that concern with the proper we propose to do pre and post construction noise testing. Um, you know, and and 
one thing that I may not have mentioned in the proffers we're proposing is a commitment to look for additional noise mufflers and and ways to further decrease the noise. But no, I don't think we would be in a position to offer noise testing equipment. I I, I don't think we'd want to do that. I wanted to make one last statement. Um, I just want to re remind everybody that the Virginia state requires a comprehensive plan and the comprehensive plan uh, gives guidelines to the board of supervisors and the planning commissioners as to what can be built or should be built in certain areas. We are in what's called land unit J and it is um, defined as having low intensity, low office buildings, public utilities, um, these kind of things. So the, it has this, what's called a FAR, 0 0.35 FAR. In this, the county has to completely ignore that. They have to completely decide to rezone this property because the property is CA I-5 and it's zoned specifically for a, a dealership. In order for the county to get on this cash cow, they have to go through and say, we're going to take all of that C8 and we're going to make it a whole I-5. And then, yes, you can build your data center there. But in doing so, they have to violate a bunch of things. One of them is the FAR. The second is that they ensure that the surrounding uses are not negatively impacted by the higher intensity. They have not made any assurance about that because we do know we're going to have some maximum noise levels there. And it's also for the higher intensity um, where they're supposed to protect existing residential areas from the encroachment of commercial development. So all of that is being completely ignored by the county by zoning, rezoning this completely to an I-5. They did so, the office used to Right. But that's them. why I encourage you when we go to the planning yeah. commission to come to that and do a heat, do speak, speak at the hearing or phone in. They have phone in options. They have video uh, phone in options. I mean, video uh, options for you to provide a video in advance and then you can send it there. Um, so I really need to speak out because they have to approve the rezoning before they can approve this, these two pieces of uh, options. Of Otherwise, it stays as it is. If they don't rezone it, it stays as it is, as it is and it will be a deal issue. So just keep that in mind. That's the sort of step that I mentioned earlier from in this report from the evening. They will bend over backwards to get this to happen because it's so the net result is our committee has been presented this this proposal. The planning commission will hear it sometime in the future, if not this month, the next time it's scheduled. And we as a matter of the joint assembly district land use and transportation committee members, usually come up with a recommendation. You might say, this is great, better than best things to slice bread, or we hate this, don't do it. Our advice is not gospel to the planning committee. They can choose what they wish to do. Other times we come up with a middle plan that says, we're not happy with this as it is, here are our concerns. Let's see if the planning commission can address it. All right. So you have the range of day, day, and concerns. Normally, we would prove something and say we have no objection to it. Rather than saying we're approved, we say we have no objection. There are extreme cases where we say best thing since sliced bread, we approve. In this case, I imagine we're going to say this has, could go forward if our concerns listed A, B, C, D, E of double set are considered. Okay, so I'm going to ask. But wait a second, just here. one other thing. So, so in in this area, you know, I'm thinking about all these countries I've visited, and I saw these lovely little fishing villages that suddenly had this enormous high rise mooring the you know the area. So once we do this enormous data center, what's to prevent that 
from going through the rest of the plan due to H when it's not supposed to. Like they're going to say. Don't, don't say the thing. thing. It's not supposed to. Yeah, yeah. Not supposed to is well, not a term that this county understands. Every law and plan and comprehensive amendment and zoning is subject to modification. So the land you live on was zoned for farms and planned for farms until it was planned for your residential development. When residential development of single family homes became impractical, they built apartments and multi family property on land that was single family. And when those apartments and single families became impractical, they built high rises. The situation changes. What was Tyson's Corner 60 years ago is now something different. So it's never that this is what it is. It's what it is now. And, the county. and so I want you to be aware of it. You cannot use that as an argument because things change. Fairfax Center area was going to be extension of Greenbrier. Now it's the Fair Oaks Mall and Fair Lake Shopping, right? In the 1980s, it changed. It's so, just that the character of the area is the character of the area will always change. Okay. Oh, okay. Hold, 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 hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> the character of an area can change. I have lived in this county since 1975. I have seen it change. Some parts very radically, some very low. Change will happen. The type of change, the intensity of that change, the timing of that change are actions which are the responsibility of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. Period. The Planning Commission only makes recommendations to the Board of Supervisors. What our group does in the 20 some years I've been involved with it, here on the table is to say, from the perspective of the Sully District communities, here's our opinion, plus, minus, balance, whatever it might be. On every individual application that comes before us. Some we support very strongly. Others we say, well, there are a few challenges, but generally it seems to be an appropriate action to pursue. Others we say, this, we have serious major issues with. I think what we've been hearing tonight and in the previous session that was conducted is there's a lot of questions and issues by you, the surrounding residents. And I would say by us who do not live within sight distance of this site. I think it's a broader perspective question affecting the entire county and all of Loudoun County and all of Prince William County, which seem to say, here's a way to make money quickly. Here are the benefits of doing that. We don't have as much traffic. We don't have any demands for our services. It generates more tax revenues. But you say, well, maybe that's a good thing. I've been here long enough to know that developments in Northern Virginia that were built to be the most wonderful things you ever saw look a lot different. Very small. And an I-66 and Route 50 is a good example. That is no longer a premier shopping center with all the changes that's going through it. You look at other places, landmark along I-95 in Alexandria, closed, being redeveloped. Two other malls, White Flint Mall in Montgomery County, and another one north of there, his name is Casey at the moment, both closed. Whatever the name of it is, it's changed. That is a reflection of the changes. Where I live, Franklin Farm, when I moved here in 1975, it was still an active farm, as was the space now occupied by Chantilly Highway. At one time, Fairfax County was one of the top five counties in the entire Commonwealth of Virginia in terms of agricultural product. That disappeared a long time ago. Reflected change. Was that a good change, bad change? Good question. You can debate that over multiple alcohol beverages of your choice sometimes. 
I think it's a situation where this is an action. We know what the choices are. We know what the current zoning allows for this parcel land is. Might not be what people want, but they say, well, it's right next to the auto complex. And would another one be such a bad deal? Probably not. Would that generate revenue for the county? Yes, it would. Um, it wouldn't be an empty piece of land anymore. If it were to be developed as a warehouse, would it generate revenue? Yes, it would. If it were to be developed as a data center, would it generate revenue? Yes, it would. There are pluses and minuses in the details, the eight or ten items that we went over this evening, that would say they're all a little different for which of those future takes place. But again, looking at the comparison, the only one we can really look at is the default is it will be an auto dealership. So everything that it's all about. Maybe you don't like the concept of an auto dealership there. You could argue either way. But saying that's our point of comparison. You know, I think what we can say is, well, here are some questions that this group and others have had. Questions are not fully resolved. They still need further examination. So at least express concerns about the need to more fully address these. Some of the points that you noted about, well, what does the staff report really say? Is the staff report a true representation of the proposals now being discussed? Yes, no, maybe. There's a lot of unanswered questions. We could go on for another couple of days talking about those unanswered questions. But the first step would be to say, what general comment do we, the committee, want to present? To the planning commission and to our representative on the board of supervisors. Do you have the information you need to make that decision at this point? Let me point out one question to this is that a lot of what we spoke about today isn't a planning consideration. It's not a comprehensive plan consideration. It's a rezoning in the comprehensive plan allows. It's what said if we say you could build a data center here. And they come back and say, oh, we're going to build the data center. Then they have to go through the rezoning. And then in the rezoning, you have the noise contours and these other things. But the plan amendment doesn't implement what we're looking at. If you see what I'm saying, there are degrees. Should this be a data center or parking? All right, if it is a data center, you come in, then you have to meet all these rules. And you meet them during the rezoning and the Plan and the comprehensive stuff comprehensive. What is it you do after the rezoning? Like site plans. The site plan that goes into the specifics. And so although we're talking about concerns about a data center, they're not part of the comprehensive plan amendment. They're part of the site plan and rezoning if it goes forward. So all the things we talked about now cannot be implemented in the comprehensive plan because the comprehensive plan doesn't get into the weeds. Okay, these are valid concerns during rezoning and site plan consideration. They're not valid points of a plan amendment. Okay, yeah. I'd make a motion. Please go ahead. Uh, I don't have enough information. We don't have a step. The pro is being a step to report them out. Yes, it is available. But they have a better thing to look at it. And what was the recommendation to step report? The recommendation for the staff report right now um, is, is not finalized, so I don't want to. Yeah. 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 Normally, when our committee makes a recommendation, it's contingent upon site, the staff report being an acceptable report. And if we'll say we accept this and recommend it go forward, pending an acceptable staff report. If the report from the staff is not acceptable, we then ask the proponents to come back to us and tell us what they're doing to make it conform to the thing. Now, on the other hand, just because the staff says that the site plan should not go forward, doesn't mean that the planning commission and the board of supervisors won't approve it anyway. And has happened before. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, although we think that's the important point, it's not necessary because the Elected officials who have the final say can choose to make their own intelligent or not so very decision. 
Okay, and as our planning commission member behind this is shaking her head, they have made reports to the plan and the, the planning commission has said, don't do this. And the board has moved aside and said, we think it's a good idea. Just okay. to be clear, the staff report came out last Tuesday. They're recommending recommending approval. Okay, so if we were to say we recommend approval based on a, a positive staff report, that condition's already been met. But yeah. as this gentleman already said, there are problems with the staff report. I've already pointed out a bunch of the I understand. <laughs> what I'm saying is that's that staff report will be analyzed, spoken to at the planning commission. The planning commission members will sit down and bring up the staff as well as the component and ask questions to the staff and say, hey, staff, this doesn't sound kosher. Can you explain it to us? And sometimes they go back to the staff and say, make changes. And otherwise they say, oh, that sounds reasonable. In fact, one of my points pointed out to the staff that made it was safe and the planning commission did verify that in fact they were mistaken when they made the statement but it was proved anyway so it didn't make a difference okay so john what would you make of it? well everything has changed with new evidence uh i don't have enough information i see the changes that uh commissioner spain is concerned about for ruling the plus side is I like the growing tax base. I like the fact that it doesn't mean fringe out traffic too much. Uh, I, I really encourage you to put the transmission lines on the ground. On the, on the comm side, I'm really concerned if I lived in Pleasant Valley there, I wouldn't want that. On the horizon, plus the yeah, screen. Uh, secondly, I don't feel the staff adequately addressed. How it's going to affect the RPA. So, all those in the mix here, and I'm sure Commissioner Spain will get the answers to all of these before the hearing the end of July. I hope we can defer this, just have a, a decision on the dollars next time. Okay. So, based on your discussion that the Planning Commission will need to hear this after our July meeting, do I have a motion that we have a Motion at that time. That's right. Just move and get out. Can you hear the session? Second. Okay. So, John, I want you to miss in your motion that we're going to accept at a later date those points you want to address. You can do that by hand. Okay. So, we will let all of the famous guy close. Okay. So, our motion is deferred. I was going to ask if you have the points that you are questioning about. Can you please share that? Oh, sure. Well, they all want to and, 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 and just one other quick thing is there another copy of the sign sheet floating around? Yeah, right here. Oh, okay. Make sure everybody signed it because what we're going to do is we're going to post this all on our next meeting agenda and you will be able to see the documents we're talking about for our decision with the points that we have. And they will be posted on our meeting and, and, and uh, I am going to do something. Would you, if you do not want your name added to our mailing list, please tell me, because otherwise I'm going to make sure to get our emails. Okay. So you'll be informed of what's happening. Oh, can I just ask a clarifying question here? Please. Look, John, your motion was uh, for decision only at the next joint. So you, you won't have us back to like do another presentation. <laughs> Now, you would be welcome to come. Right, no, just a point of order. We've not heard from our Sully District Supervisor, who is the left, but that's Kathy. Right? He isn't going to meet not that with her. We've not had a chance to have that meeting. If I don't have that right, the man here asked me how you make that decision. Your decision of power should be in the safety of the members for the citizens, the single family home. So, don't no, you're mistaken. Okay. Your father is saying it's not necessarily the single family home. Because that would imply that multi family homes don't have the right to be there and attached townhouses don't have the right to be there. That's under smart zoning. I would agree with you there. But my point being is we do not think that most single family detached apart housing is the only preserved model. And we do not say, and we have never done so, that that is always the preferred model. Okay? The way you just said that, it sounds like that was your deal. Sorry, and I uh, think remember, if you haven't picked up the business card from me, there is a website that I have put up with the staff report in there 
Uh, so you can feel free to look at it, um, I'll, but I'll highlight some things and, and put more information that we've had this meeting, but I encourage you to visit that site. Right. Email me. I will also uh, have a, a list so that we can, as a community, get together to decide on topic points uh, for the planning commission and for the board of supervisors. But we only have five minutes to talk in front of the planning commission because so, we are not a homeowner to each person. Oh, so you don't have a homeowner association. Yeah. You did. Yeah, right, exactly. Let, yeah. let me also point out that our meetings that we have here have been recorded and they're posted to the Sully District Council YouTube page. So if you search the Sully District Council on YouTube, you'll see all of our meetings where our videos exist. And in some cases, my videos existed, but we didn't have the sound turned on. So I didn't tell them that. that was early in the learning scheme of things. So, well, I can't hear anybody. All right. So we think we're in a better shape now by all these little things that we're doing. And we thank you for the contribution we received last time that got put in the way. One opportunity to talk to a good supervisor on the 20th. Yeah, if they, well, that's currently was the planning at the commission okay. date. Like our meeting it, here. Yeah, we have completed. Right. But now what I'm it's saying not. is going to hopefully go to be postponed. I guess we won't know that until tomorrow for sure. No, but the website is right there again. So, so the state of the and and given by our supervisor, she will be here and talk for about an hour about things that she wants to tell us. And then we have the opportunity to speak. We do not speak about specific land use cases because that's not. That meeting, okay? That meeting is, and Kathy will tell you, is I haven't heard what the planning commission is recommending, right? And she says it would be free, it would be premature for me to give you my input without the planning commission's trusted advice, okay? It's, it's like the president saying he's guilty before he's going to trial. But she has not seen it, but I've said that yet, okay? So never mind. Yeah, so wait, so meet with us on, on the 15th of June and then she canceled it. But I got all of her staff to not come. What was so I can say my right in fairness yeah. this, she did, she does have a family emergency, and we have still not heard the status of where, where she stands. She just didn't cancel arbitrarily. Oh, she didn't so, send anybody to represent she no, didn't have the people crying right. because she the people who she would send would not be able to answer the questions to get with the and we know she is the leader, and so she wanted to be there to support whatever. Okay, know, fair enough. We, we, are, the we, we are trying to get another meeting. Right? So, hopefully, there will be another emergency, yeah. and we'll have that meeting. So, yeah. uh, now that hopefully we have some time. All right. With that in mind, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming here tonight. Uh, let me point out that our next meeting, including the decision only, has uh, item and the item on the meeting is uh, oh, my computer and uh, I'm going to come over here. And then uh, the uh, <laughs> So, how many of them are in my meeting? We have two items on the agenda. You should be able to speak behind me. We have a comprehensive plan amendment on the public facilities policy plan update. There are going to be proposed additions to both the Brookfield Elementary and the Kodak Elementary Schools that are going to be coming in front of us. And we will have a decision only point for this as well. This can change. This is what we're planning for July. Our next Southern District Council meeting last month it was the report from Richmond. This month it's the state of Sully. In September and October, we will be working with the League of Women Voters in the Fairfax area to sponsor candidate debates. For both the delegates and senators and the jurisdictional offices of the county school board 
supervisor, put in the court, Commonwealth attorney, sheriff, chairman. And we will invite those candidates. The legal woman voters will invite those candidates, and we will co-sponsor. It may or may not happen on the 27th of September. It will happen on the day that the legal woman voters schedules it. For some, we will be the co-sponsor. So this is our target date. We may not have it on that day. We don't know that yet. But this is what we're planning. We don't normally meet as the Southern District Council during the summer. We have met when there have been important items for us to consider. We thank you for coming. We're going to be doing offline a question about the parking reimagined. We will be looking at that and preparing a response. We'll do that offline because it's close to 10 o'clock tonight. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming. We appreciate you being here. And thank, thank you. you. And remember, we get paid as much as you can do this. Let me just say thank you, but that's it. Not even a thank you. Well, I want to say the other one. I won't do that. I'm being So we will be trying. And it's not up to us. I guess they made lots of recommendations. They have not always made it. Let me say this for you. I just worry about it. Okay.